Hello sports fans and welcome once again to yet another edition of MSU Sports Circle, the defining voice in all things sports. I'm your host Tyler Smith, joined as always by my good colleagues Matt Johnson and Justin Neely. Fellas, we've got a jam-packed show of excitement today. It's going to be a good episode. We'll kick things off right now with discussion one, and that's college football. There have been a lot of upsets this weekend, but two in particular stood out in my mind. That was Oklahoma and Wisconsin. With that said, Oklahoma State jumps to third in the BCS rankings. My question to you fellas is, can Oklahoma State still make the national championship with one loss? Justin, I'll start with you. Uh, I'm not going to rule them out. I'm going to say it's rather unlikely. You take teams like Oklahoma, who still have these power teams, the number eight team, the number 13 team, and they still got to play them. Uh, this year in college football, you have a lot of good records going on. And you have a lot of, you know, BCS, let's face it, there is no playoff system. They like to do difficulty of schedule. They like to throw their own spin on it. So what I'll say is, I'm going to say unlikely. All right. Now, Matt, with hearing that, what do you think? Can Oklahoma still do it? Or are they just going to fall on the wayside and do it to a BCS Bowl that's lesser than the national championship? I kind of, kind of disagree with Justin. I kind of feel they can. When you've got an undefeated K-State coming in playing them, you still got number 16, Texas A&M, and also number three, Oklahoma State. That goes to show you, you still have major games to play, even though we're coming off a bad loss with Texas Tech. I, I think one, if they can go with just that one loss, I think it's a possibility they still can. Fair enough. Now, Justin, a point that you made, and I'm glad that you brought up their strength of schedule. We talked about this before the show. Given the teams like Kansas State and Texas A&M, and then ending the season with Oklahoma State, I think Oklahoma can get in there just based off strength of schedule. Justin, did you get us up to speed with that? I would, I would assume that strength of schedule will always play a role in it. But like I said, there is no playoff, you know, no playoffs in college football. So, with that being said, you know there are a lot of teams who are going to have good records this year. So how it's going to play off, how you're going to pick one over the other, what you got to do when your teams like this is not only win because you're already playing against legitimate programs, what you have to do is hope that some of these other top teams lose. And that being said, like, I, like we've all agreed uh, for weeks uh, <coughs> or whatever, SEC is the only other powerhouse uh, teams you have. That being said, why can they not go? We're not going to see all the SECs go to BCS Bowl because they're all beating each other up. That's a good point. And I tell you what, one of the games that's going to be a staple, I think, this season, we've talked about it all season long on the show, LSU, Alabama. Whoever wins that one will more than likely end up being undefeated. It's going to be absolutely insane, something to look out for. But we'll move on from that talk, and we'll go to our college player breakdown. This week, it's Case Keenum of Houston. I think you guys are familiar with that player. Justin, I'll let you start this one. Get us up to date with what he did. I feel like some people may be unfamiliar with him. I mean, he put up mad numbers. I mean, 376 yards passing, six passing touchdowns. Which six passing touchdowns alone is what's impressive to me. Last season, he did have an injury, so he was out for a while, which is what makes this that much more impressive for me. A player to come back after an injury and to show out like this. I mean, his 2011 stats are 194 completions, 23 touchdowns. And he averages a little over 10 yards uh, every attempt. So it's almost a first down every time this man decides to throw the ball. Absolutely impressive. Now, Matt, hearing those stats, how much more impressive is it to you with him coming back from a knee injury? Just, like I said, this, not even just whatever, knee injury, elbow injury. I, I don't care if it's just a headache. Playing football is just so physical. Just anybody coming back from any type of injury is just amazing, especially with a knee because being a running back, you have, to, you have to have it to get left to right, do what you got to do, run people over, et cetera. And it's just it's very, very impressive. Well, I think you mean to say a quarterback, uh, but he does do some running, but not on the knee necessarily. I think that'd be a little tough for Case Keenum. I think what it is, he's so good. I see him playing everything. I call him an all-purpose player, you ask me. Just very impressive football player. All right, fair enough. Now, with that said, guys, do you think that Case Keenum might be one of those sneak in players to the NFL draft? I feel like he's one of those players that could sneak in, but he's definitely one of those players that will have to go to the right program with the right coaching and someone willing to give him an opportunity and actually work with him. All right, fair enough. Well, that's going to wrap up our first segment. We'll go to commercial break and be right back here on MSU Sports Circle. Crumpled old dollar. Aww. Remind yourself to always bring your Eagle card. Dude, you need the Eagle card. Wow. 
Always keep Beaker Buck loaded onto your Eagle card just in case. It's the fastest way to make all of your on-campus purchases. costume contest going on. You want to go? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Welcome back. We're now on discussion two here on MSU Sports Circle. Guys, we're going to talk about NFL. We have a new segment here on the show. It's called Did You See That? And I think what I'm talking about, I think you guys know where I'm going with this, 62 points. I say again, 62 points dropped by the New Orleans Saints on an, an Indianapolis Colts team that is not quite the same. Justin, could you explain why? Uh, first and foremost, I give credit where credit's due. Drew Brees did his thing. He had 325 yards and five touchdowns. On the other end, I feel like the Colts have embarrassed themselves, let down the fans, let, let down the NFL. I mean, they, they put a bar for us to expect what Colts are going to do. I'm not going to call them Indianapolis Colts. I'm going to call them the Colts. But with that being said, at first I was upset. You know, defense. You lost Peyton Manning. You didn't lose, you didn't lose your defensive master. You didn't lose your defensive, your defensive magician, if you will. But after I sit down and review it, does Peyton Manning have that big of an impact on his team? Did losing their leader really take a toll mentally on the entire team, not just the offense. And I think that could be potentially what we're seeing right now. Absolutely. Things could not get much worse in Indianapolis right now if you're the Colts. And like you said, I think this really does show just how important Peyton Manning is to Indianapolis and to their success. Like we talked about before the show, his absence has affected the entire franchise as a whole. Well, right now what you're seeing is a player became bigger than the franchise. When you say the Indianapolis Colts, it's very rare that you don't think about Peyton Manning. It is Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts. And what you're seeing is, is just this. It's just that. He's that great of a player that when you remove him from the equation, everyone's starting to suffer. I think both the team is honestly mentally, they're focused on the next season. Absolutely. Now, Matt, we'll go from the Indianapolis Colts game to did you see Arian Foster and what he did on Sunday? It was just, just very impressive. This is one guy I've not even really talked about. I, you know what I want you to do for me? I, this is, I know this is kind of long. Read, read his stats for me, Justin. Read, 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 read Mr. Foster's stats for me. 25 carries for 115 yards, two touchdowns, and five receptions for 119. I mean, it was pretty, pretty All impressive. All purpose. All purpose. We did it on rushing, and we did it on receiving. That's, that's, just, that's unbelievable to me. You don't, that's, we, that's nothing you're going to see every week. And I don't, quite frankly, I don't think we're going to see it the rest of the season. No, I don't think we will. And guys, like we talked about before the show, those I don't think I don't think fans understand. Those are video game numbers. That that that's something like if, if me and you were to sit down and play a game of Madden, we probably still couldn't get those numbers. I mean, the man had over a hundred yards in both receiving and rushing, and then he had touchdowns in both categories. How do we? How do you do that? Like mentally, how do you? I mean, that's just unbelievable. Did the coaches say, "I want you to be a running, and then I want you to pat, get it's, catches"? It's not coaching; it's, it falls upon the player. Why can't I do that? That's when your players rise above and you know pull through performances like this. Why can't I receive and dominate? Why can't I run through you, around you, over you? Why can you stop me? And he answered that mentally. He was on another level, a whole another level. And I think it's safe to say that Arian Foster woke up that Sunday and he ate his Wheaties. Now, I'll ask you guys very quickly, which was more impressive, Foster or the Colts, Matt? Foster. Hands down. Hands down. The honest truth, I didn't get to get in this, but I'm going to say it now. The, the Colts season is, it's, I'm, I'm not impressed with what the Saints did. I'm just point blank, not impressed. I honestly think they are mentally just done. It's not even about Peyton Man. It's just, we've, we quit. It's just, we've quit. I don't know why. I fair, did. fair enough. Justin, Foster, Saints. Foster. It's that, it's that simple. The Saints beat a lesser Colts. All right, enough said. That's all the time we have for this segment. We'll be right back after this commercial. When you 
got some homework and you need a place to go When you're working on a project and your computer is slow There's a little place on campus that I think that you should know about The first story of the library is what I'm talking about Walk past Java City and then you will see The new commons area is where you should be They got computers and printers, couches, tables and more It's the perfect place to go for study time galore Come back once again. You're watching MSU Sports Circle, the defining voice in all things sports. At this point in the segment, we'll have our MSU weekly recap. But first, we have a special video package from our correspondent Rachel Stadelman. She was in Moorhead and at Jane, not Jane Stadium, but Johnson Arena rather, as the Big Blue All Stars came to town and Kenneth Reed had somewhat of a homecoming, and they played against Kentucky Christian University in an exhibition match that turned out quite a crowd at Johnson Arena. We'll go to Rachel now and see what she has for us. The Big Blue All-Stars started off strong in the first half, dominating over Kentucky Christian. Players showed off their skills by making dunk after dunk after dunk. At the end of the first half, the All-Stars led 79-42. to During each timeout, players interacted with the fans by throwing souvenirs into the bleachers. Players seemed to be having fun and entertaining guests even when they were off the court. K-Time stole the show from announcer Tanner Husterberg in the second half when he grabbed the mic and started announcing the game before he was put back into play. The All-Stars continued to dominate in the second half with Cousins and Fareed leading them to a 147-110 win over Kentucky Christian University. After the game, New Center caught up with some of the All-Star players. What has it been like being experiencing this with all the other players? Just um, we have a chance to go around and um, meet the fans again. And that's, um, that's happy to, um, for our fans to come out to, to support us. How do you like Moorhead? It's good. I mean, Kenneth Free is kind of like his homecoming thing. Yeah. Um, it was exciting to see him do um, well on the court and come out and um, see his hometown again. Playing on this team with all the other players. It's been a lot of fun. We get to go around the state and just uh, give the fans a, a show, and it's been a lot, great experience. And are you excited for hopefully the NBA lockout to end and go play for the Pistons? Oh, and yeah. I know Tayshawn Prince plays there, so that'll be cool. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to, uh, to just get ready to play, and hopefully they can resolve it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And now we get into our MSU weekly recap here in the studio with our correspondent, Devonna Lee. Devonna, we'll get right off into it. The MSU Eagles had another heartbreaker on homecoming against Dayton. We lost 30-28. to 28. Can you tell me what's going wrong? Do you really want me to? I, I do. <laughs> I might hear somebody's feelings, but um, it's ridiculous. Totally. I mean, I can't say anything positive. The defense is just terrible. It's just garbage. I don't even understand, like, what they're doing out there when they go out on the field. It's like, do you need some more Gatorade? What do you really need? I mean, do you – okay, l prepare yourself. Let me tell you, Dayton rushed 317 yards in kept possession for, like, nearly 10 minutes longer than MSU. And then let me tell you, MSU rushed 1.7. A five-year-old can do that. Pee-wee pee football can do that. Come on now. Rush more than that. Come on. Are you serious? No. It was ridiculous. I, I really don't understand. Like, Dayton used a dominant ground game. I will give them that. And that's what they did to be. <sighs> it was embarrassing, especially for homecoming. Those numbers are, are not very good, folks. It's... It's teardrop numbers. That, that, that's what I call those. Well, thank you for that. We will move on <laughs> from the heartbreaker, and we will go on to MSU Volleyball. Now, that is not a heartbreaker. Yeah. That's on the other spectrum. That's good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Can you talk to the fans about just how good they are? Well, volleyball is on a crazy win streak. It's now 12 games. Um, they're now at 12 games, and they just are monsters on the court. Um, Junior outsider Ellie Robertson had has led the Eagles to this point, and I've been very proud of her this season. She's um, ranking at first in the league and 34th in the nation, which is just crazy. That's what really is leading the Eagles on to this winning streak. Also, junior um, Caitlin Clark ranks among the nation's top 20 in assists 
And as a team, the Eagles are the top in the league at kills, assists, hitting percentages, and lowest opponent hitting percentage. So meaning all of this coming forth, the Eagles are really going to just kill this season and just win an OVC tournament. I'm going to put my words on that. All right, and we certainly hope that that happens. Just as a reminder, the MSU soccer team picked up a key victory, ending their three-game losing streak over Longwood on Sunday. We'll be back after this break. Hey man, you're not supposed to be smoking on campus. Don't listen to him, it isn't like anyone's gonna know he's smoking a cigarette. That's a really bad idea. Remember, Morehead State University is a tobacco-free campus. Welcome back, now we're on discussion three. And that is the MLB World Series, guys. It's been a fantastic series so far. A lot of excitement. We'll get right into it. The Texas Rangers won 4-2 to two against the St. Louis Cardinals in an exciting Game 5. Justin, we'll start with you. What happened? What didn't happen? I mean, let's be real. Napoli and Ron Washington is what happened. I mean, that was one of the best one-two combos I've seen. I mean, this is why I'm loving baseball. This is, this is what's making me love baseball right now. I mean, you know, Ron Washington with the coaching strategy, he didn't disrespect pool holes. He, was, he, he put his pride to the side and said, guess what, team? He's better than us. He is a monster, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to freeze him out. We're not going to let him hit the ball. And as a result, I mean, they walked pool holes three times, and it, it really did work. And on the other hand, you know, Napoli stepped up with two RBIs in the eighth. Napoli's two RBI in the eighth was absolutely key because that was a point in the game where it was tied two to two. You had solo shots from Adrian Beltre and company, and then Napoli steps up, bases loaded, huge situation, sends a shot to right center. I think he might be on pace to possibly be the World Series MVP, but we'll have to see. There are two games left to play. Still a lot to go. But Matt, can you talk about, we've, we've heard from Justin what went right for the Texas Rangers. What went wrong? For St. Louis. I don't care about any of that. I'm going to be honest with you, fellas. I've been saying St. Louis Cardinals, and I'm going to stick with the St. Louis Cardinals. The Rangers, yes, they're up, but who has, who's playing the next two games at home, though? Well, the Cards have the next two games at Bush Stadium. That's all we need. That's all you need to know. Home, I mean, excuse me, home field advantage will, will it make them come back and roar back and win this World Series. I'm going to keep saying that to the end. I'm not changing my mind. I really feel this way. Now, now, I, now I hear your point, but, but, I, but I have to ask you, though, you're saying the same St. Louis Cardinals that had left 12 runners on base 12 could runners not on base. capitalize at all on their scoring, had botched plays with two caught steals, and then could not even get their coach to communicate properly in the bullpen to bring the right guy in to close things out, is going to win back-to-back -back games in Bush Stadium things. against the Texas Rangers team that has momentum. Things, things happen. And that's what's going to happen. They're going to gain the momentum back, and they're going to come back and win this. I really do. I really feel this way. All right. Well, I'll ask you this then. They're down, but you never count them out. That's one thing you can't do in any championship in any sport. Never count them out. Fair enough. But what has to happen for St. Louis to take over in game six and seven? One thing, and it's that. Heart. That's all it takes, really. It's just heart. It's not necessarily what coach needs to do this. Not no, I'm not going to spotlight no individual players. It's a team effort. It's all that comes down to heart. And if they have that, you, they, they don't look at it like, okay, we're down, we don't have a chance. If they look at it like, you know what, we're down, but we have two games at our place, let's come back and win this. And that's how they have to do this. I think you're right. It needs to be a team effort. They can't just rely on guys like Albert Pujols. They have to collectively come together as a unit and show them why they have the home field advantage. Justin, I'll ask you very quickly, what does Texas have to do to win their first ever World Series? It's very simple. Stay hungry. Right now, they have the edge, regardless of what field they play on, for one simple fact. 
this, they have an opportunity to bring greatness to this baseball club. And they know that. And they honestly, as I've stated with other teams, they do not believe that the St. Louis Cardinals are better than them. In their mind, St. Louis Cardinals have to win two. Fellas, all we got to do is win one. Let's make it happen. We're, right. we're marching to the arts. That, that's, that's, my, that's my slogan for the day. We are marching to the arts. We certainly are, and we can't wait to see what happens. We'll be right back after this commercial. Please don't throw that trash on the ground. I know someone is watching you now. Recycle me. Back. We're now on discussion four. Guys, we're talking about a topic, even though the NBA is still in a lockout, there was an NBA rank that came out on ESPN last week in which they took 91 experts and they had them do the current evaluation of 500 NBA players. Now, I think the issue that we have is in the top 10. I'll go ahead and read you off the top 10. According to ESPN, number one, LeBron James. Number two, Dwight Howard. Number three, Dwayne Wade. Number four, Chris Paul. Number five, Dirk Nowitzki. Number six, Kevin Durant. Surprisingly enough, number seven, Kobe Bryant. Number eight, Derrick Rose. Number nine, Darren Williams. And number 10, Blake Griffin. Now with that said, Justin, I'll let you go ahead and start off. Did the ESPN get it right? How many, how many professionals came together collectively for this list? 91. I don't hear one professional that came together to make that list. My, I mean, Kobe, without debate, it's not an argument. He is still top five players in the league. As far as LeBron James goes, I'm going to be all the way honest, he's not the best player on his team, let alone in the league. My question to these professionals, and I can ask anybody on this panel, what makes him number one? Dwayne Wade is the number one player in the league. Uh, let me correct myself. A healthy Dwayne Wade is the, n the number one player in the league and will go down as top three shooting guards of all time when his career is said and done. I mean, let's look at the facts. Who came to who? Dwayne Wade is nobody's Robin. The, and if you look at how the Heat played, remember, trouble in paradise. LeBron James came in, dominated, was the monster, the beast, the force that he's been in Cleveland, and they were losing to the Indiana Pacers twice. Now, what happened when LeBron deferred to Wade? They went to the championship game. Who didn't show up? LeBron Case James. in point. One thing I do like about this list is Chris Paul's finally getting the love he deserves. As far as individual performances go, point guard wise, Derrick Rose was the best point guard last season. The best point guard in the NBA, with that being said, is Chris Paul. He, there is no weakness to his game unless you want to count size, which is not a factor whatsoever. Where people are going wrong is the man got injured. He didn't start playing worse. He was hurt. You can't blame someone for hurting their knee. Postseason numbers alone tell it. He was averaging over 22 points a game, four rebounds, and still dropping double doubles. He literally, single handedly, destroyed. The Lakers team, every one of their defenders tried to check him, double team him, including Kobe, Gasol, and Bynum, and it couldn't be done. So for that, I'm very, I, I think that was a very wise decision, putting him in the top five, because I feel like he doesn't get enough just due. All right. Matt, you've heard from Justin. How do you feel about the top ten? I'm right there with him. This list is it's all over the place, and I, I'm right there with I disagree with you 100%. I, I'm kind of questioning, are these guys really NBA experts? There's no way, and I repeat, there's no way Blake Griffin's nowhere in the list. How do we get in a list that quick, being only going into your, your second season, third season? That's, that's just no, no way. Are we going by the best players, or are we going by the fan, the fan favorites? My personal opinion, I think it's the fan favorites. You look at your players like LeBron James, White Howard and et cetera, and you got to look, they, jersey sales, arena sales, and I, I, I really see, you look at that, and it's, it's all comes down to fan favorites. Who's all over ESPN all the time? You got to look at the white. Why is that highlight reel? LeBron James, highlight reel. 
But it's like you keep saying. I'm just I don't understand how is the where I mean how in the way is Kobe Bryant number seven, and this is the man with five championship rings. It's how I don't know, but I will one MVP. I mean that's unacceptable to me. It, it's absolutely unacceptable. But I'll ask you quickly, Matt, your top five. My top five, no order, real quickly: LeBron James, D Wade, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant, Carmelo Anthony. All right, Justin. I'm going to throw a little something in the mix. I'm going to say LeBron James, D. Wade, Kobe Bryant, Chris Paul, and just to make some folks mad, Amari Stoudemire. All right, fair enough. And that'll have to do it for this segment. We'll be right back after the break. What's wrong, dude? Second guessing that cheeseburger? Maybe you should take another look at that before you eat it. Don't eat me. Now how could you be thinking of eating that when really you're thinking of a slow-cooked chili-covered geodog with cheese with your selected choice of chips? Throw that thing away. Located on the first floor behind the elevator. What about me? Back. We've come to a close yet again here on MSU Sports Circle. We have interesting closing segment topics today. Matt, we'll start with you. What do you have for us? I'm going with this, this college conference uh, shuffle. Uh, it was breaking news, as we all heard today. West Virginia is not going to Big 12. I found that very interesting. You already have Syracuse gone. You have Pittsburgh gone to the ACC. And you have other teams maybe looking at in the Big East to leave, like, you know, UConn, UofL, and et cetera. And maybe replacing them with Central Florida, Air Force, Boise State, and Houston. I mean, where is the Big East going right now? I, I'm just really confused. I'm just as confused on this issue as I am with the NBA lockout, what is going to happen. I'm, just, I'm really just sitting back and just seeing who's leaving, who's going to stay, what's going to happen. Are we going to crumble? Are we just going to come together as one, two, three big mega conferences? I don't know. Time will tell. I think that's a good way to put it. Only time will tell. And I think the one thing that I, I've noticed, a lot of the coaches have been talking about these conference shifts. And the way that I see it and the way that I think the coaches see it it's something you're going to have to get used to. But like you mentioned, mega conferences, having 16, 14 team conferences, I really think that that's going to be the future of college football. It's going to be maybe eight mega conferences. You really need to. Because, I mean, real, real quick, the Central Florida Air Force, Boise State, that they, those names are they're, they're no offense to the university, no offense to nothing athletic there, but they, they don't bring no firepower to a conference like the Big East. No, they do not. Now, Justin, we'll go to your closing segment. What do you have for us? Now, NBA fans can relax just a little bit. Even though we have no season that has not stopped the players for putting on high-talented, high-profile type pickup games, if you will. There are two players in particular trying to bring two to the people. LaMarcus Aldridge is trying to bring one to the Rose City. On top of that, you have Allen Iverson actually trying to organize a two-day monumental for the fans. Without a doubt, it will be a huge statement if Allen Iverson can get some NBA players to come out to Vegas, a wonderful venue. Well, that's going to wrap things up for us here on MSU Sports Circle. For Tyler Smith, Justin Neely, and Matt Johnson, we say thanks for watching.